So I told you the wheels would tie this whole package pretty damn nicely together. Beast all the way. And I will talk uh, more about this in the order of the build. So you get all the lay down, low down, lay, low. You will get all the low down on the wheels in the build process, which is about 22 minutes. So enjoy that. And uh, we'll join you at the end for some more gibberish, maybe. And the final way in. So obviously the only way to start a new bike build is with lasers. I had taken the measurements of Dara's old bike, so I needed to mock that up on the magma and get this stack from the BB to the handlebars so I could determine where to cut the fork steerer tube. The tall headset top spacer together with about 20 millimeters of normal spacers is what was needed to match the stack. There might be some experimentation in the future to see if we can lower that or not, but this is the starting point. With the stereo tube taped up and marked, I could put on my saw guide and head outside to my makeshift working bench for the cut. I sprayed the fork down with water during the cut just to keep the carbon dust from flying all over the place. The legend says it's not the best thing to breathe in. Having a mask is also required unless you want to get cancelled. Some fine sandpaper to dull the edges of that cut. And that's pretty much the most nerve wracking part of a bike build done, in my opinion. Of course I had to check the weight of the fork after the cut, which ended up being 348 grams. That's down from 374 uncut. Next, getting the brake hoses rooted through the frame. Since these was bought as a shift lever caliper kit, the calipers come pre-installed with hoses and even filled with brake fluid. The hose end are plugged so you don't lose any of that fluid until they are cut for the final fitting in the levers. The hose was easily pushed through the chainstay and out the bottom bracket where I put on the phone tube that will help with any possible rattling noises. A 180 back into the frame, up the down tube, eventually out through the hose port on the front of the head tube. No cable routing tools was needed here, which was good as it would have meant cutting the hose plug at the end and that would have been messy as the calipers comes loaded with brake fluid as I already mentioned before. The fork was a bit more fiddly I have to say. I did not really expect a hole for the hose in the steerer. I thought it would be like my Trekamonda where you just push the hose and it will simply pop out in the right hole. Obviously not the case here. I think a hooked pick which I didn't have would have been the quickest way to fish the hose out. But I eventually made a tiny lasso of a zip tie and got the hose out of that hole. If there's a will, there's a way. Uh, loosely attached the brake caliper to the fork and it was ready to get installed into the frame. Some prep for the frame and the fork with uh, grease. Then the bottom headset bearing on the fork. A little more grease for good measure. Some more brake hose fishing through that head tube opening. Uh, I put a little mark on the front brake hose to know which is which. Especially since Dara has his front brake on the right lever. Which I need to remember. Prepping the upper headset bearing seat before sliding the fork all the way into place. Top bearing on followed by the split ring and then the headset cover that has a rubber ring seal that is tight enough to hold the fork in place without any stem on. Although at this stage I had already flipped the frame around on the stand and was now attached by the fork so gravity helped keep everything together anyway. Expander torque to spec, 8 Nm, clean off any remnants of grease on the steerer tube. On with the two spacers and the cockpit to secure everything. And I have to say this carbon beast stem is super tight. It was an even tighter fit than my THM stem which was also super tight. I don't know if this is a thing with carbon stems, they need to be tighter not to put too much stress on the carbon when tightening the bolts, but definitely different from a normal aluminium stem that you can easily just slide over the stair tube. Just an observation. So uh, DI2 cables uh, with the Shimano 12 speed, only two wires from the battery in the seat post to the respective derailleur. 
I could easily push the longer 1200mm wire from the rear of the chainstay to the bottom bracket without any tools. The wires did not come with cable clips to keep them from rattling and I tried to find clips for the slightly thinner ST300 wires but it seems you can't buy these separately at least at the moment of this build. In the end I did use clips made for the older thicker ST50 Di2 wires and they actually work better than I thought. Not quite as tight but they should stay in place and do its job. Normally it's in the down tube you really want clips on the wire where the cable has a lot more room to flop around. So it's not super critical at all if you run a semi wireless 12 speed setup. But since I had an abundance of the old clips I thought what the hell better be on the safe side. The front thoroughly wire in and then add the rubber grommets that comes with the frame. I used my broken internal wire tool to pull both wires up through the seat tube. Uh, by simply taping them together to the routing tool but you could definitely do this without any dedicated routing tool like a piece of string for example so uh, definitely not necessary to invest in these tools for this particular frame for the di2 battery dara had gotten the new battery holder for the dn300 battery the old version of this and uh, other similar holders does not fit over the new three port battery without some kind of work with a knife. I wonder if it was just luck that he got the correct battery holder or not, but kudos Dara. Two ports will be used here and Shimano specifies to always use the center port for one wire, although I have just used the two on the sides for symmetry reasons, because I am that guy. This worked as well on my first install when I didn't know about the Shimano recommendations but it's always better to follow those. So uh, one cable in the center port here. The unused port must always have a plug otherwise the system will not work as I also discovered on my first firmware update. Then I installed the seat post and the seat post wedge and of course this is where the mandatory forgetting of the wedge cover that need to be on the seat post before installation. Uh, yeah. Two things I really liked about this wedge compared to my Allied Echo for example. The two pieces is held together with a small screw so you won't drop one part down in the frame which I have done on the Echo. Also the hex screw to tighten the wedge is at an angle so it's much easier to tighten with larger tools. Good stuff. So as the TI2 wiring was in place, it was time to get the derailleurs on and make sure everything works before sealing the frame up with the bottom bracket. Rear derailleur on, getting all the wire nice and neat, not forgetting that little extra rubber cap on the rear DI2 wire. Although I've been without that one on the Trek now for a year and it doesn't seem to really impact the waterproofness of the connector or anything. Uh, but it looks neater though. Front earlier on, making sure the wires are neatly tucked up into that steerer tube. Not the steerer tube, uh, it's the seat tube I'm fingering at the moment. So here I just wanted to make sure that the system was working, uh, connecting it to the E-Tube app and pair the shifters to the rail derailleur with the QR code. Then a quick check that no updates are needed on the levers as they need to be wired temporarily when updating. It would have been easier to do that before installing them on the bars. You can check my video on the update process on my BTS channel if you want to. Shimono has said that the update will be able to happen wirelessly in the future. So this information might be outdated when you see this. Anyway, both levers had the latest update already installed, so I could proceed with installing the bottom bracket. Quick clean of the BB shell with some alcohol wipes. The BB is the Token Ninja, thread together BB386 EVO with a 24mm adapters for the Shimano cranks. It's been quite a while since I had to install a BB in a press fit frame, but I still had my secret sauce. The Wacos brake protector that I use for all my press fit installations instead of grease or retaining compound with excellent results. Uh, I've gotten many questions about this Wacko stuff uh, during the last few years since it's not really available outside Japan. And from a few discussions on older videos, uh, some people claim this is 
brake pad grease for cars and motorcycles. And that should be available from other brands. But again, I only use this particular Wacos product, so I can't really guarantee anything in that regard. There I had also gotten the token installation tool for the BB, which made it very easy to install. To start with, I threaded it together by hand until both cups were touching the frame. Then I used the 3 8 socket lever. Is that what you call it when it's not the ratchet? Uh, anyway, I got the cups flush with the frame, then finished off with the torque wrench to the specified 25 to 30 newton meters. On with the 24 millimeter adapters, which are very nicely built with rubber seals, both internally and externally, uh, but they are pretty hefty. And that is basically why this BB is on the heavier side of the spectrum. Since it's a Shimano crank set, I thought it was only right to use some Shimano premium grease on the crank spindle and the threads. Mostly I've been using some park tool grease this far uh, during the build because that's what I have most of. It really doesn't matter though for these parts as long as it's grease. Non drive side crank on and the preload nut finger tight to remove any play. Safety tab down. Then alternate tightening of the clamp bolts up to the recommended torque of 12 to 14 Nm. Then it was time to turn my attention back up to the cockpit area. I loosely installed the shift levers, put a small section of shrink tubing to keep it tidy underneath the stem. In the end though, I had to remove this, which I will explain a bit later. I used some zip ties to secure the hoses to the handlebars in preparation to cut them to length. But before that, I wanted to get the lever position sorted. So on with the wheels so I could get the bike level. And I adjusted the lever position to what I thought felt good. Then back on the sand so I could use my lever set tool to match the position of both levers. I've done a separate video on this tool in the past. If you're interested to learn more, linked up in the corner or down in the description. Then it was time to cut the hoses to length. Uh, I was simply uh, marking the hose with a white marker, as markers do, they leave marks. And then used the brilliant Shimano hose tool to cut and then install the new barb in place. I know it's annoying how much I love this tool. Ooh, love it. Can't stop. Can't stop. Uh, rinse and repeat for the other side. Uh, job done. Since the calipers, hoses and brake levers comes filled with brake fluid, the levers felt really nice and firm without any bleed. But it can't hurt, I thought, so I did a quick top lever bleed and a few bubbles came out, so I guess it's never a bad idea. Just one thing to remember, always have the bleed blocks in the caliper when you do any kind of bleeding. The bleed block will ensure that the pistons are pressed all the way in. So say if you do a bleed with the warm pads and a spacer, the pistons might be slightly more pushed out. And when you bleed and fill up the system with fluid, you can end up with too much fluid in the system, causing all kinds of issues. At least that is what I've read. And as a bonus, you will avoid any risk of brake pad contamination if you use the bleed blocks. After that, it was time to shrink that shrink tubing. And it was after this I realized I could not use this solution since when turning the bars all the way to the frame requires both hoses to slide independently out of that hose opening in the head tube. We need to be able to turn the bars all the way for use with train bags to take the bike on a train here in Japan. This might have worked with shrink tubing if I had left a bit more slack in the hoses, say 10 millimeters or so, but that in turn would have made it less visually pleasing. So in the end, I settled on just ditching that shrink tubing altogether. The handlebar wrap is not something I will dwell on for too long. While I like the little adhesive butterfly strips they include for the lever clamp, I did not like the Silka bar tape at all for the way I wrap at least. It just didn't conform the way I wanted to or I'm used to with my favorite most super light bar tape. I had to go back quite a few times before it was somewhat decent. 
but it's still far from what I would like and that's probably down to my skill to be fair. It's also very short which is why it's pretty light and cut. This is all that was left over. So yeah, I'm leaving it at that. This is not a tape I would choose personally and it's definitely not the best tape job I've ever done either. So let's just move along. We're getting closer to get this up and running. Uh, since the wheel had not arrived at this time of the build, I used my own all road wheels that I have uh, the same 11 to 30 for cassette to size the chain. I used the usual big, big method that is thread the chain over the biggest cog in the back, skip the derailleur and over the big chain ring and where the chain meets, add either two or three links depending on where the inner link is. And that's where I break the chain. I need two inner links to connect the quick link, but before joining that chain, I needed to thread the chain through the derailleur as well. Easy to forget. With the chain in place, it was uh, B screw time. Shimano has removed much of the guesswork with their B gap guide that comes with all the new 12 speed derailleurs, at least the Dura Ace and Ultegra. I have not seen the new 105 but it would surprise me if that wasn't included. Quick indexing of the gears, but since this won't be the wheel set that will be ridden, there was no reason spending a lot of time getting this down perfect to the nanometer. But just get it in the ballpark and get the limit screws sorted. Here I also realized there was no chain stay protection on the frame. They did include this very thin black one with the frame set. I didn't feel like that was the best solution so I dug up one from my own stash it's actually some no brand stuff from Amazon that I've used on all my bikes and been very happy with it's much thicker and it's semi transparent so it will definitely look better than that black strip only thing I'm a bit worried about is how well it will stay on matte paint but uh, time will tell I guess now back to the drivetrain and the front earlier uh, getting that positioned over the chain ring angle the rear of the cage slightly inwards, tighten that bolt to spec and then adjust the support screw to get the cage parallel with the chain ring. Then it was just a matter of following the adjustment procedure in the eTube app. It will shift the chain on the rear for you so don't forget to turn the crank when it tells you to. For me this procedure had generally worked really good. Uh, I had to make a few adjustments out on the road on my Echo but it's a great starting point at least. While I was messing with the front derailleur, I kept hearing this slight rubbing noise, but it didn't sound like it was from the brake rotor. And it turned out it was actually the front derailleur wire that was rubbing on the tire. The frame clearance is officially 30 millimeters, but as you can see, I have my 32 millimeters gravel kings on here and no issues with the frame clearance. But the derailleur uh, with the 90 degree wire connector holder is a bit too close for comfort. Uh, so just like I did on my Ally Echo, I skipped that 90 degree wire holder and routed the wire over the derailleur instead. And that will give you a few millimeters extra clearance and eliminate any risk of the tire getting dragged in by the tire. Arundel bottle cages on, uh, I gotta give kudos to Aurum for the cage bolts. Probably the lightest stock bolts I ever seen come with a frame. One gram per bolt on the dot, good stuff. A dab of grease on the bolts, my mate is a sweater. And that can cause corrosion pretty quick with dry bolts, especially if you ride indoors a lot. Uh, I always try to check mine regularly and re-grease them just to be on the safe side. Pedals on with a dab of grease, of course. Uh, look at those blinky lights. Looks like a lot of extra weight, doesn't it? Yeah, power meters. What are they good for? Absolutely nothing. Back up to the cockpit and apply some carbon paste to the handlebar and stem. Torque down that faceplate to 4 Nm. Then the same with the stem bolts for the steerer. The seat post also got a coat of carbon paste before getting torqued down to its final height. I do really like that wedge cover, I have to say. Just a few finishing touches left, uh, getting that safety clip on the front caliper bolt, as well as the safety pin in the rear caliper. I also did a quick derailleur hanger alignment check, just to make sure everything was in order before torquing down the derailleur bolt. 
So at this point the wheel had still not arrived but the bike was going to be ridden that weekend as we both had signed up for an event. So for fun I weighed the bike with my all rolled wheels uh, which is actually really light to be fair but there's still 32 mm Gravel King slick tires in a tubeless setup and it came up surprisingly light at 7.19 kilos. Now fast forward a few weeks and the wheel finally arrived at my place. As you probably figured out already, the wheels are the Beast RX60. And like I said in the first video, they will complete this pretty neat package together with the finishing kit also from Beast. 60mm deep rims, 21 internal and 28.5 external, built onto DT Swiss 180 hubs with CX ray spokes. Only one little hiccup, it was delivered with an XDR free hub instead of a Shimano HG one. But I will sort it out in a minute. These came with tubeless tape installed uh, and had it been mine I would probably have removed it just to get the exact weight of the wheel set. But there I really doesn't care that much and it was such a clean tape job as well so the weighing had to be with tape. 1490 grams for the set and I can only guess what the tape is it felt thicker than my usual tape but say 20 grams for both wheels that might be widely overestimated I don't know but should be pointed out that the claimed weight was 1440 grams for the set since I didn't really know this tape too well I took a bit of extra precaution and heated up my pick with a lighter before making the hole for the valve Tape felt pretty sturdy, so probably wasn't necessary, but you know, better be safe than sorry. The Lesign valves are pretty neat, uh, with a valve cap working both as a valve core remover and a little wrench for the end so the valve won't slip while tightening down that nut. However, it's a bit too heavy to actually keep on the wheel while riding though, don't you think? Mounting of the Schwalbe Pro 1 tires in 28mm was a breeze. My usual tubeless solution, a little sponge with tire bead wax on both sides of the tire has yet to let me down. No problems mounting the tire without any tools, with a little massaging at the end to get the last section over the rim. I removed the Valcor and could then seat the tire on my first try with the floor pump. And when I let the air out, the bead stayed seated, which is the most important indication of a successful tubeless installation, in my opinion at least. I did inflate the tire again with the Valcor in and it held air without sealant overnight as well. Center lock brake rotor on, no surprises there. Then this little problem with the XDR free hub. Luckily I have a set of XP hubs myself, so I simply moved over my Shimano HD free hub over temporarily until Dara could sort out a replacement. No tools needed, just pull and replace, making sure you don't lose any of the EXP ratchet parts in the process. As for sealant, 40 millimeters or about 30 grams of well shaken standard orange seal in each wheel and the wheels were ready to be delivered since the bike was no longer at my place. So let's do an awkward cut to the outside and finish this build off. So the question, with these 60 millimeter deep wheels, our goal for this total bike was a sub 7.5 and did we do it oh yes we did man. so what was it then 7.475 25 grams to spare i will admit we didn't have the garmin mount on i just remember that now so we need to claim that this garmin mount is 25 grams which is probably might be more but i will find a, a lighter one i promise and if someone's wondering why the hell would you put 60 millimeter deep wheels on a bike that's in the mountains all the time uh, that is because this bike is not in the mountains all the time unfortunately Dara doesn't live near me mostly flat roads around his part of the woods but today's ride up in the mountains was not too bad no it was all good mm, the wheels go uphill yeah we already did a pretty big ride down to Izu that's about over 200k and an event ride about 130k 
and you did a couple of rides by yourself. Mm. So do you have about three, almost a month on the bike? Almost. Are you happy? Very. Did, did, did I build it correctly? You did. Oh, hey. you did a damn good job. Let's end this, for I can't hold this camera up any longer. I don't have the upper body strength for this. Already had a fight with the expander plug, so. Shh, I'm down. Peace. <laughs>